Hi, everybody. It's Steve Jagger, co-founder of Addy. Today, I have Cornell Schreiber here with me to chat a little bit about his world, how he became mortgage-free, and what he's up to in the investing world. So, Cornell, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's good to be here. Yeah. So, um, I appreciate you joining. The You've got a podcast that's called Build Wealth Canada Podcast. I've seen you're all over YouTube. Um, you've got your own investing course. You talk a lot about have you paid off your mortgage? I think you talk about how you retired. Um, can you maybe like take us back a step to when you I know you you had real jobs and did sort of a, you were on a normal uh, trajectory and then you kind of pivoted. Can you kind of just sort of take us back to how that all how that all happened? Yeah, yeah, it's been quite the quite the ride. It, it's been it's been it's it's worked out well. Uh, but yeah, it definitely was not like a straight line. <laughs> a lot of different things happened. Uh, but yeah, basically, um, so just going all the way back, I graduated in two thousand seven from Wilfrid Laurier University. I did the business co op program there, business administration. Uh, and so when I graduated, that was basically you know I, I get my first job, and in less than a year, we hit the great financial you know two thousand eight financial crisis. Uh, so that was an interesting uh, event. Good way I mean, to start your career. Yeah, yeah. So I actually did not get laid off, which was nice. But I remember an entire floor of the building got got fired. It was nuts. It was just like the mm. the CEO of it was in the U.S. and he's like, "We're just gonna cut this." And so it was just nuts to see an entire floor get wiped out. And so that was a pretty big moment because you kind of you know real. I, as a kid growing up, I was like, oh, well, as long as you work hard and do a good job, your job will always be secure. Things will be good. Right. And then here I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure all those people, I mean, all those people were not doing a horrible job. Right. I mean, clearly other things happen. And even if you play your cards right and do a good job, you could get, you could get fired. So, um, or, or you know, through no fault of your own event. So that was a very right. uh, interesting thing. Uh, and so that was pretty pivotal because it actually scared me from going into, uh, investing in, in equities in general, because I remember, you know, I'm this business new business grad. I'm I'm ready to invest. We've got we're making good money now. And then, you know, I hear my director. I rem I'll still remember this day like it was yesterday. My director's like, "Oh well, I lost like a couple hundred thousand today." And you're just, you know, as a kid, you're like, "Whoa, whoa that sounds crazy, scary, crazy." Sounds serious. <laughs> like this is this is bananas, right? And so at that point, um, I was like, "All right, you know what?" Um, like my so what my girlfriend at the time was not my wife. We're just like you know what I'm terrified about this. Um, let's like what if we just focused on paying down our mortgage? What if we just did that? It's like a sure thing, you know. We're, we don't have to worry about this volatility, this craziness. Let's just focus on that. Um, and so that's basically what we did. Now, in retrospect, I would not do that again, knowing what I know now. Uh, so we actually, I would say that's probably like one of the biggest financial mistakes that I made was instead of pumping money into the mortgage, I should have actually pumped it into equities at the time. Uh, that would have been, uh, I mean, because we missed that whole run up, right? Uh, we yeah. missed that whole recovery. So in retrospect, I regret it, but it's like, okay, come on, you're you're a kid out of high, out of university, <laughs> you know, you you learn and stuff, right? So, um, yeah, so we basically did that, uh, and then what we did too is we decided to just live on um on one salary, and so the way we typically and sometimes you know things would come up, so we'd have to dip into the other salary, like certain like you know car repairs and that kind of stuff, like if there was something significant. Um, but generally, yeah, we would just live off one salary, and so we were pumping a ton of money into the mortgage. We made sure we got one with like good prepayment privileges, ones where we could actually like double. Uh, our monthly payments if we wanted to. And so we just went at it. Um, and it kind of like, you know, stuck my head in the sand, like a, what, what is that animal? The ostrich, I think does that. And just kind of went at it, right? Again, wouldn't recommend this now, uh, but that's what I did, right? And so fast forward and you know, by, by 29, we had our mortgage paid off, which was pretty neat. Uh, and so it was a big deal. Like Yahoo, we had a story on us and Yahoo Finance and Money Sense Magazine. Like, you know, they came down, they took pictures of us. It was a really, really cool thing. Um, and so I was like, this is amazing. We have all this extra cash flow every month. This is awesome. And so leading up to that, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be amazing. We're going to have all this extra cash flow every month. We're going to be able to spend all this extra money on fun things. It's going to be great. But I came to the realization after that happened that, wait, wait a minute, we're actually pretty behind on retirement savings now because, you know, we've just been pumping all this money into the mortgage. Uh, and then, yeah, my wife had to match, like, you know, the, the RSP matching at her work. So we obviously did that. Um, but I mean, apart from that, we, you know, we were just pumping everything else into the mortgage. Uh, and so I was like, shoot, I, I need to like 
we, we can't just blow this money on fun stuff. We actually, the prudent thing would be to actually start investing for our retirement because we would like to, you know, be able to do that. Uh, and so yeah. that, but as, as you know, I'm sure, I mean, there's so much conflict of interest in the industry. We have some of the highest mutual fund fees in the world. Uh, and so it was very, very, um, I, I thought, okay, I can't just like go to some person that I think seems legit, ask them, and then everything's going to be taken care of. I need to really be diligent and do this myself and, and look into this and research this heavily and learn these best practices. Uh, it's basically so that I can be kind of like a DIY investor and figure out the best practices of doing it. Um, and so that's what I did. And so what I did at that point is I started the podcast, which is the Build Wealth Canada podcast that you mentioned, which has been running like uh, 10 years now. Um, and so that was the whole idea behind the podcast was, okay, instead of just getting the opinion of one person, who may or may not have a conflict of interest. What if I try to find people that don't have that conflict of interest? So they're not like trying to sell me stuff. And that's why, you know, they're <laughs> they're so bullish on that investment because obviously they're, they make money off it. So let's try to not find those people. Let's try to find like, you know, fee-for-service financial planners, other experts in the field that have been in it for a while um, and pick their brain on the best practices when it comes to investing. And then I, my rationale at that point was, well, if the podcast takes off, awesome. Like I'll have a business, it'll be extra income. That's great. But even if it doesn't take off, then I still got to learn all these best learn. practices from all these experts specifically for Canada. That was like the other big thing. And then I get to apply it to my own investments as well. So to me, it was like win-win regardless. It's either going to be a win or like an amazing win kind of thing, right? Um, and that's the other thing. There's so many podcasts out there and blogs and everything that are just fantastic, but they're in the US. And so... As a Canadian, I was trying to learn all this. And, you know, they, they start talking about all these different investment vehicles in the U.S., like the Roth IRA and things like that. And it's and uh, as a Canadian, you're always like, well, that's great that this, you know, tactic works for you uh, and you've optimized that. But does that apply to Canada? We have RSPs, TFSAs. Is, is that different? What are the nuances? We have a different tax system. All, you know what I mean? So th th there was, a, I felt a need where that, that of mine that wasn't being met, which is like, I want to learn this stuff but Canadian specific. And so that's why I started the, the podcast. But then, yeah, the, the podcast took off. Apparently there were, it was more than just me trying to figure this out <laughs> as a Canadian. Uh, and so, yeah, so like now we're at 2.2 uh, million downloads. Um, it's it's one of the biggest, it, it's like the biggest fire podcast in Canada, which is Financial Independence Retire Early. It's the, uh, definitely one of the biggest investing, personal finance, financial planning and podcasts. We're always like at the top of the ranks. So uh, it's it's been fantastic. And and the interesting thing is even though now, you know, we fed our financial independence number, all is good. There's always more stuff to learn and optimize, right? Because the government will change something. They'll add some new program. Some taxes will change. Some new products will come out. Like when I started this asset allocation ETFs weren't even a thing. And now they're like this game changer for a lot of people. So, um, so there's always more to learn and I'm an optimizer, always more to optimize. And so, uh, you know, I, I keep the podcast running. I get to learn. I get to apply those lessons to my own, um, to to, my, to our own investments to make them grow. And then I share that with other people. And it's nice too because because the podcast has become so large, I'm able to get these really good guests that are like they really know what they're talking about, uh, and the people that like an average person might not have access to, or it would cost them a boatload of money to be able to get like a consulting thing with them. Right. And so that instead I get, I have access to these people now, which is great. And then I get to apply their lessons for my own finances, but also share them with the rest of Canada. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's it. And then was that 32, uh, we actually hit our fine number. It was lean. I would say like lean fire, which I would define as, you know, like you have a, you're financially dependent, you technically don't have to work anymore, but it's not like your portfolio is like multi-million dollars. So like you still have to live like pretty frugally, that kind of a thing. Um, and so when we were 32, that was another thing where like we hit it, we became one of Canada's youngest retirees. Happy to talk about like what we did to get up to that. Cause there was a whole bunch of different like business ventures, real estate investing. I, I, I dabbled in as well, yeah. you know, started, started several businesses, that kind of a thing. Um, and then, so we got there. We, my wife and I quit our job, our full-time jobs at 32. Uh, she became a full-time stay-at-home mom. I, at that time, had an offer from basically um, like my from my dream job, essentially, to work like part-time from home, doing like what I always wanted to do. <laughs> and so I took that on. So that was kind of nice because instead of going from two full-time incomes, we went to like half an income, which is better than you know zero incomes, right? It helps with the transition. Um, yeah, so I did that for two years, um, and then eventually fully retired. Did that for a little bit felt pretty unfulfilled and just being fully retired because I'm you know I was in my 30s at the time uh and then took over the Canadian Financial Summit which was this opportunity that came up because I was looking for something new 
grew that quite substantially, sold my shares in that. And now I just run a podcast again. So I guess you could say I'm semi-retired because I do run the podcast. But apart from that, that, that's it. So just managing my investments, optimizing them, learning best practices, um, sharing with the rest of Canada so that we can all grow a little better, not get ripped off. Um, yeah, that's kind of the my attempt to make it a short origin story, <laughs> but I feel like it's gotten pretty long. I'm a chatty one. No, that's I good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. And so you, you're talking about these ages. How old are you now? I'm 40. I, I just turned 40, 40. in July okay. of this year, 2024. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah. you're today, you guys are both technically retired. You're doing the podcast. Um, and that's, and you're surviving off of investments that you've already made and maybe income from the podcast. Is that? Yeah. Like, like the way that it is now. Is, so the way we've currently structured it is that the invest, basically anything that the podcast makes. So like if my wife has like some side gigs, things like that, that's all kind of like extra, like fun money, you know, cherry on top, that kind of a thing. So like pure discretionary. Uh, but then in terms of living off the portfolio, the portfolio covers all the non-discretionary expenses and also some discretionary expenses, right? So it basically lets us live the lifestyle that we want. Um, but I've learned my way that like just go, trying the full retirement thing that I I, I don't want to just do like a full stop. Uh, and so this is kind of a way to like, it's fulfilling, it's fun, it's intellectually stimulating. I feel like it's my way of giving back to actually like help people. Uh, I'm a giant nerd when it comes to this stuff. So it's actually fun to like learn and optimize to me. It's like, like a, it's like a game at this point. Um, and then, but like it genuinely helps other people. I get these, you know, emails all the time from listeners of the show. Um, so yeah, so that, that's kind of, that's the way that it's structured now. So I, you know, I, I would say semi-retired because some people will say like, oh, you're technically doing the podcast. So you're not fully retired. So like, okay, yeah. fine. Like use whatever <laughs> definition you want. Like different people have different definitions of what retirement is. Most retirees, at least from some of the stats I've seen, they do end up working in some capacity or generating income still in some capacity, but it's like doing something they actually enjoy that they would do for free. Um, like I would still right. gladly be interviewing people for free, even if I, there was no sponsors and stuff, it'd still be fun to interview people to learn this Got stuff. It. Yeah. So can you, for, for our audience, you mentioned fire and you mentioned lean fire. Can you, can you kind of give to someone who doesn't know what, what you're talking about? What, what is the yeah, definition yeah. of that? Where did it, you know, where did it come from? I like, I know that there's a the whole fire community, but can you just kind of yeah. explain what it's, what it's all about? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I apologies for the jargon. I've been at it for so long now. Sometimes I just assume that people have heard all these acronyms. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, FIRE stands for financial independence, retire early. And in a nutshell, the whole idea behind it is that instead of waiting, let's say for that traditional age of 65 to retire and never work again, the idea is, well, what if you actually just had a really high savings rate? Like in our example, we were able to save like pretty much half our income and other people that have hit it, that's typically what they would do as well is they would basically have a really high savings rate, like 50% ish. It can vary depending you know, on a bunch of factors. Uh, but the whole idea is you, instead of like, oh, just saving that like 10% a, a month or, you know, like you hear these kind of rules of thumb. Instead, you're like, forget all that. <laughs> well, not forget all that, but like, that's nice that you're saving 10%. We're going to aim for 50%, uh, let's say, so that we can actually just live off our investments and don't have to work. Or if you do work, it's doing something we actually enjoy. You know, we don't need to ever worry about having to find another job, uh, things of that nature. Um, so that's essentially what the FIRE movement is, the whole you know FIRE community. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a bunch of people that have pulled it off in the US and in Canada as well. Um, yeah. Is, is that sufficient enough or did you want me yeah. to elaborate on any well, particular then there's, piece there's of like it? lean fire and fat fire and all these yeah. other versions of it, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've noticed it's kind of, it's this beast that's morphed into these other things. Yeah. So the, the lean, so the lean fire is more so, you know, you've, you've got an audience, the way I would define it is your portfolio is enough that you could live off sustainably long-term, even if you retire early, but it's a relatively frugal lifestyle, right? Um, so you, yeah. it is something where you hit that number, but you know the discretionary income piece isn't as big. Um, and then it's like the on the other end of the spectrum, you've got things like fat fire. And so this is people that are like, well, I don't want to do this like frugal thing. I want to retire, but actually have like boatloads of money to like spend and do these like high-end resorts or whatever, things of that nature. Um, and so they're trying to get fire, but they're not, they're not okay with settling for a lower uh, expenditure, uh, you know, they actually want right. like the, 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 and so obviously you need a much bigger portfolio for that. And then of course, so those are kind of, I would say like the two extremes of the spectrum. Uh, and then you've got, you know, things somewhere in the middle, um, which is, yeah. So that, I hope that makes sense. So, which is, yeah. I would say that's, that's pretty much where, where we are. Like, I'm not looking to travel first class on an airplane or something. Uh, like I'm okay, not doing that. Um, but I'm also like, 
it, it's also nice to have some extra money. So like we have kids, it's nice to go travel with them, things like that, as opposed to like, no, no, we got to move to like super low cost area. We can't really travel much. Or if we do, it's got to be like ultra frugal, you know? Uh, so so it, it, again, I'm not judging either way. Uh, different people have different priorities, you know, values, what appeals to them, the way they're wired, right? So you, you, it's kind of nice to explore these options and see what's good for you. Yeah. How did you like think about the math for what what makes it like at 40 or 35 years old? Like, did you have a dollar amount of like, I need to hit this dollar amount and have it earning this percentage return? And then mm -hmm. did you would like make assumptions around death? Like, how did you? Yeah. How did you how did you sort of come up with the math as to what the right number was? Yeah, so I would think of that. It's a really good question. Uh, and that's probably the most common one that people have, I would say, um, is, is the, and not just people that are in the fire movement, but just humans in general, they want to know when can I retire? How much do I need to retire so that I don't have to, you know, go back to work, try, you know, look for when a job 80. when I'm 90 or so, yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, um, so, I mean, yeah, if you want to be like a Walmart greeter when you're 90 and that's your, you get joy out of that. Good, great, good. Right. But like to be forced to do that for financial reasons, I, I imagine that would be pretty rough. Um, yeah. So to answer your question, I would look at that um, problem. I'm using air quotes here, like a challenge, uh, kind of in two phases. So there's the sort of macro high level, and then there's the one where you really start nailing things down at a micro level. So on a macro level, the, the 4% rule, which I'm, I'm probably a lot of your listeners have already heard of, that's a pretty good general rule of thumb to use sort of like, you know, back of the napkin kind of math. Um, to get you a ballpark figure of how much you need. So essentially the idea is basically based on the study and they actually done like several studies relating to that at this point. Uh, if you Google like a 4% rule early retirement, you're going to get a boatload of information that you, you could research this stuff quite extensively. But basically long story short um, is that you're able to withdraw 4% of your portfolio inflation adjusted annually. And that is sustainable in the vast majority of cases. Now, there are some nuances to that. There are some criticisms of that, depending which rabbit, you know, whose rabbit hole you go down. Some will say that's way too conservative. Some will say that's way too aggressive. So again, like, like this is a thing where like you could have then like multiple podcasts just on that one subject alone. But again, to just at a high level, if someone just wants to know, like right now listening to this, how much do I need roughly, with, with emphasis on the word roughly, uh, estimating 4% is typically a good number to use. Uh, so like, let's say you have a million dollar portfolio, you'll say, okay, so I can take out 40 grand a year from that sustainably long-term inflation adjusted, right? So it's not like you're taking, you're still taking out 40 grand 10 years later, every year you would increase that amount by inflation. Um, so basically your purchasing power stays the same. Um, so that, so that uh, I mean, I've researched this to death and <laughs> it's, it's basically the best kind of back of the napkin quick math that I that I have found for people to be able to get a good answer to that question. Now, so that's really good. I would say when your portfolio is still on the relatively smaller side, you know, once you get like somewhere where you think you're getting kind of close to that fine number. So let's say you think you need a million based on that back of the napkin math, the 4% rule. And let's say you're getting up to like, I don't know, like 600, 800,000, something of that nature. Um, yeah, well, yeah, maybe even 600,000. I would say at that point, you may want to take it to that next level. And now you would basically, what I would recommend is you get someone like a fee-for-service financial planner, somebody that does not sell any investment products. So they get no commission, nothing like that. They have no conflict of interest. Have them actually crunch the numbers for you in a good financial planning software. And to see, okay, how much do you actually need? Uh, and so now you're going to get into a lot more detail, a lot more granularity. You're going to need to know things like, well, how much do you actually spend right now to live the lifestyle that you want? And based on that, what do you estimate to spend once you hit your financial independence number? Because some expenses are going to go down drastically, right? Like you may only need one car, for example. Your mortgage might be paid off by then, right? So there's all these different, there's, there's a whole list of things that you need to consider when you make that transition. And so that's why I would advise you do want to work with someone like that who actually has experience in the space. Um, and then that way you can fine tune things. Because the other big thing too, is there are different levers that you can pull if let's say the markets took a hit or something changes. And so you want to know kind of, you want to know kind of what those levers are um, so that you can kind of pull them accordingly. Um, because if you pull certain ones, you may actually be able to retire years earlier, like, like literally years earlier. Um, versus if you just go by the 4% rule, 
and you're like, nope, that's all I'm doing. That's I'm not going to analyze this any further. I mean, that's a pretty big thing if you could have, let's say, retired two years earlier, but you didn't because you didn't want to look into that level of detail. So some of these levers are like, are you going to generate any side income? Are you willing to move to an area that is not as expensive? Like if you're earning a ton of money right now working in Toronto, okay, well, when you're retired, you don't need to live in Toronto anymore. Maybe you want to, and that's fine, but then realize you're going to need more money, but maybe you can move and that's going to drastically change your expenses year to year. And so, you know, what, what do you do there? Maybe you move to a more lower cost country, right? To, to cut your things even more. There's all these different... Different, um, I would say again, levers that you can pull um, that can really change how much you actually need. And so you do want to go down that rabbit hole once your portfolio gets closed. But it can be overwhelming if someone's just completely new to this. <laughs> and so that's why I'm like, do the four percent rule. That gets you kind of on that gives you that gives you that rough idea. And then once you're getting closer to that number, then okay, let's actually dive in. And, and kind of narrow down the details because, hey, maybe we could even retire right now, right? You won't know unless you actually dive into this. Right, right. Switching gears. I know you had mentioned earlier you were in the landlording game. Yep. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like what, what triggered you to go and buy a, a second uh, property or an investment property? Where was it? And sure. It go. Sure. Yeah, so I... So back in the day, before I entered the whole, like I, right now I just do ETF, total market index investing. We, I can dive into that. If, again, that's jargon for people that aren't in that, that some for some people. So I can dive into that if you want. But before I got into that, I was all gun ho about being a real estate investor, you know, owning multiple rental uh, properties, that kind of a thing. Um, so to answer your question, but, but I, was, I was having trouble basically finding a property that I could get the cash flow positive. Like I'm in Kitchener Waterloo, it was really, really difficult. Like I, basically, I couldn't find any properties. That what were. year was this? <laughs> oh, um, good question. Because um, I'm sure it's worse now. But like you're talking, yeah, sure it's worse now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was um, like a low two thousand. Uh, maybe, okay. Um, yeah, like wow, 2010 wow. onwards, maybe I'm, I'm ballparking. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. It was like an ongoing thing. Cause I was like training myself to learn how to do all this stuff for like quite a long time. And then eventually I was like, okay, I'm ready to pull the trigger. Let's do it. And then I'm like, holy crap, I can't, none of this cash, none of these properties cash flow positive. So I'm basically, I'm going to be bleeding every single month. And I hope and hoping that the appreciation is significant enough to make it worth my while, which which was you know scary for me, right? Like the because now every book I've read on the subject at that point was basically like make sure you're cash flow positive. You have to be cash flow positive. Yes, you're you're hoping to get capital gains, but regardless of that, you need to be cash flow positive. And then I look at like the realities of the market, and it's like not in KW. And it's like, and then I learned, okay, well, you could actually get properties like that that can cash flow in other parts like of the country or or another or another country altogether, like in the US, for example. But then you have a new set of challenges, which is like, okay, I can no taxes. longer drive. There's there's taxes, especially like if you're going to the US. And then also, even if you stay within Canada, well, now you're no longer able to drive to the property. Okay, so now what? You need a property manager. Now you got to manage them. You, and it's your first property. So I kind of would want to micromanage it a little bit, right? To make sure, you know what I mean? I just like give it, give give everything to the property manager. So ran into major issues with that. Uh, so how we actually ended up entering the rental um, game, so to speak, was my wife got an my wife got an offer. Uh, but this is before we had kids, she had an offer to go work out of the Halifax office. Uh, she used to work for BlackBerry. And so we were like, hey, this is cool. We always wanted to kind of live somewhere else. You know, we both grew up in Kitchener. Uh, let's let's think that we have no kids. Let's try it, like live on the coast. This is really cool. So we did that. Um, and we're like, okay, well, while we're there, we should probably rent out our house, right? That one then Kitchener, because we didn't want to sell it. And it's only like, it was supposed to only be for a year, it ended up being six months. Um, so that's what happened. That's how we got into the rental thing. <laughs> was and, the, and at that point, I'm trying to remember, I think at that point, yeah, our mortgage wasn't paid off yet, but it was it was getting pretty close. Um, so I mean, it, th things were, um, so we're like, okay, that's fine. Like we'll have the rental, the tenants are paying off the mortgage. We will still have it when we get back. Uh, and so I got to experience that whole thing. And then when the contract or when the contract, when like the, the Halifax thing was over, we moved back to Kitchener and we're like, okay, so like, do we kick the tenants out now? Cause it's like, move back to a house. And like, we told them ahead of time, like, look, this is like a temporary thing. Um, but then we were like, well, we actually really like our tenants. Like I, I went 
nuts on the tenant screening thing because I've heard the horror stories. And to my knowledge, Ontario's got some cr like really, really strict tenancy laws that favor the tenant, not the landlord, to the point where like I was in these in real estate investing groups and there was investors that I met that were like, I will not touch a property in Ontario because they're so pro-tenant. And so like, and these aren't like scummy landlords or anything. Like it's just like, you like there's people that that can get taken advantage of as well, like on the landlord side. And so I remember, um, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, I I, I digress. But we uh, so we rented that, and then we're like, we we like the tenants. The tenants are awesome. So what if we and then and the house? I was like, it was fine, but it's not like our forever home. Like we were kind of past it. So we're like, well, let's just keep the property, keep it as an investment property, and we'll just buy another property and we'll live in that one. So we basically did that for a while. Um, and that was great. Like, you know, this is real estate was appreciating quite nicely. Uh, it was fantastic. And then eventually we got to the point where, as you recall, like things got crazy. I mean, people were like, the, this is like when the bidding wars first started going on, people were starting to do offers with no financing conditions and the home inspection conditions. And so when that, so like, again, I was studying this stuff like religiously for so long. And one of the big rules was you never buy a house without a, you know, uh, without a condition for financing and for home inspection. And all of a sudden people are like, you know, bidding wars, removing all these conditions. I'm like, this is bananas. We've already made a bunch of money on this house. Like, I think I want to sell. Like, I don't know when the peak is, but I know now is, but I know like we're, we're going to be able to cash in on this in case something changes. Right. And so that's what we did. So we sold the property, uh, made a bunch of money off of that. Um, and, and yeah, like always, and now in retrospect, like the prices kept going up, like, you know, I, I yeah. again, I don't have a crystal ball. So like at the time that was, in my opinion, the rational decision to make, if I had a crystal ball, I told you what I probably held on to it. Like I would have probably, you know, taken money out, invested it and then just use it, um, you know, just, just for the appreciation piece. Um, but I mean, yeah, so that's kind of how we got into the, that's how we got into it. And then that's how we got out. Um, cause yeah, as a landlord, I mean, I definitely did not enjoy the, like we had one time or we had the furnace break in the middle of December. It was a family with a bunch of kids that lived there. Really nice people. You know, so I'm like taking vacation days uh, to like, you know, get heaters for the house before the furnace repair person is able to come in and fix it. And I was like, this really sucks. And then like we had the, like there was just, you know, the, the, so even though the tenants were amazing, the the property, I mean, it's it's physical thing. Things break. You still got to go deal with it, right? And so when I discovered index investing uh, through ETFs, I was like, this is, I love this. This is so much better. It's actually like, it's actually like very passive for me. Uh, and so I basically went all in on that. So what is that? For someone who doesn't know what index investing is, what is what is it? How does it how does that work for you? Yeah. So with index investing, there's different types. I mean, sometimes people make the mistake of thinking index index investing is just you buy the entire market as a whole. Um, and then you basically like right, so like the SP 500, you know, things of like that. But the thing is, is but in reality, and maybe I'm getting a little too nuanced here, but it, I think it's an important distinction is that there are so there are many, many different indexes. So you can't just say, like, oh, I'm an index investor, because it's like, well, are you following like an index of like energy stocks or something, right? Like yeah. that's very different than the kind of investing that I do, which is not you know speculative at all. Um, so I mean, in a nutshell, what I do with it is basically total market index investing using ETFs. So to break that whole bunch of jargon down, um, I say total market. And that, and by that, I mean, basically I'm buying the stock market across the entire world. So like, you know, stocks in Japan, in Europe, in the US, of course, in Canada as well. So I'm not just, so basically I'm getting as diverse as you can get, geographically speaking. Um, so that's why I say total market. So I'm not speculating. I'm not like, oh, I think US is going to do better than Japan or whatever. Like none of that. It basically either cap weighted, which I can get into. If, <laughs> but uh, so you know, so that's that's total market. Um, and then index investing is because we're only using indexes that basically are meant to be a representation of the stock market as a whole across the entire world, right? So like, there's a Canadian index that's meant to represent equities in Canada. There's an index that's meant to represent equities in the U. US. Same with like international developed, international uh, emerging markets. There's there's a bond index, right? So I'm only I only buy the basically large indexes that are meant to represent equities as a whole in that geographic region. Um, so that's what index investing is. It's extremely passive, no speculation at all. Um, we've it's it's worked very well for us. And if you go down the rabbit hole of researching this, especially people in the fire community. Um, the overwhelming majority, like way overwhelming majority, basically that's how they invest. And yeah, I've interviewed like, I think like hundreds of people at this point, both on the podcast, plus I used to run a conference as well, the summit. And I mean, it's very, 
it's it's a very it's an investment that I like very much you will not find many people basically saying oh this is a horrible thing never touch etf index investing um it's you know because it it, it is a really you have to be careful because like everyone's situation is different. I don't, you know, I don't want to get like liability or whatever, but like, like I, I'm all in that basically. Um, right. And the vast majority of the community is as well. Um, and then the last kind of component of it is ETFs. So that is basically the vehicle that you use to buy it. So you buy it on the stock exchange. Uh, you can buy these indexes on the stock exchange, like you would a regular stock, but instead of buying like um, Roger, Roger stock in Canada, you're instead buying an ETF and that one ETF can have thousands of stocks within it. So it's a very good method to get very large diversification very cheaply because if you were like, oh, I want to build my own portfolio and you're buying individual stocks, well, now you're dealing with this giant portfolio of all these stocks, all this transaction costs, you have to rebalance, which is a whole nother thing. Instead, ETF, basically, it's like a basket of, uh, it can be like a basket of equities, like so stocks, a basket of bonds, it can be a basket of a mix of the two, lots of different kinds of ETFs. Um, but essentially, that's what it is. Hope, hopefully, I explained it. Let me know uh, if yeah. there was like a part that I kind of glossed over that some people may find confusing because I'm trying to make it like beginner friendly as well. Uh, no, that's but it, helpful. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, did do you and do you do you you make your purchases once a month every week? How do you how do you think about when you're adding to your position? Yeah, so when I when we were pre-retirement, like pre-fi, I would basically invest every paycheck. Um and that was a way of dollar cost average again, which again I can get into if that's like a whole nother topic. Um but yeah, so with every paycheck we would invest it. So basically in my case, uh yeah, that 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 was that was the frequency. Now it's different, right? Because we're actually like retired or semi-retired, depending how you want to define it. And so now I'm not like, you know, we're not like trying to pump money to build up the nest egg anymore. We're actually selling off pieces of our portfolio to live off of to pay for our expenses, things like that. So now it's a very different stage of invest uh, in my you know investing journey we're now in that second phase like that retirement phase which is very different than the accumulation phase because um, so because typically yeah, you want to think of there's the accumulation phase where you're trying to build your portfolio and then there's a decumulation phase where you're actually trying to live off your portfolio but also um, not run out of money as well um, and so now uh, when it comes to investing typically when I buy more uh, is if there are when dividends get issued, which is basically profit from companies, um, I will reinvest those in certain accounts. So, for example, like in our RSP, dividends get issued. Maybe I don't, from a tax perspective, maybe I don't want to withdraw those dividends uh, because then you could take a tax hit or it's a whole thing. Uh, instead, I want to take money out of our non registered account. Uh, again, we're getting kind of technical here, uh, but um, so so that's when I would basically buy like just to reinvest those dividends in those um, different accounts. So really, you know, it really depends. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, like I'll I'll, I'll get like a spon like a sponsor on the podcast, and then maybe we have enough in our cash cushion, or I don't need that extra. I don't you, know, you never want to hold too much cash uh, in case like unless you need it, right? Um, and so in my case, so maybe then I will invest it, and in, I will I'll invest it then just to keep the money working for me because I know I won't be needing it in the near term. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. When it comes to like crypto, Bitcoin, any of that, do you dabble in any of that? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, a good friend of mine has made a bull lot of money off it. He was trying to get me into it when it was super, super low. I would have been even wealthier now if if uh, if I did it. But I mean, yeah, I like so yeah, for me, I mean, if you're looking for like, you know, hot stock tips, hot, you know, like hot investments that are gonna make you rich overnight kind of stuff. Um, I'm not the guy for that at all. Um, for my thing, like, uh, it's it's index investing. It's long term, low fees. Um, you know, it's something that's been proven over time. Not speculative at all. Uh, and yeah. I mean, you know, again, I'm, I'm not judging people that want to do it. Like, it's, if that's your thing, and like, you know, some people have made a lot of money off it. That's that's awesome. Um, you know, but for me. I would rather do the passive index investing because it is passive. It is like I, I find it not stressful like some of these other things. It doesn't fluctuate as much as Bitcoin, for example. Yeah. Um, and so what that lets you do, I mean, it's a judgment call, right? So in my case, I would much rather invest in the passive way. And then this way, I have more time to spend with my kids. I get to focus on spend time on my health. I get to focus on the podcast. Um, you know, I would like things that I actually enjoy more so um, than doing these this kind of you know speculation. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. So the, for that reason, though, I I don't do anything speculative. Uh, at no, all. it sounds and, like and well, I got that. I got that vibe when you at you know the beginning you talk about paying down the mortgage and then you're like, well, maybe it wasn't my best idea, but like it made you know made sense and it was a. Uh... 
you know, it's a, a safe way to go. And then even yeah. passive investing, is safe. I, I assumed your answer around crypto or Bitcoin was probably not. I figured, <laughs> no, I, no, figured no. I would ask. <laughs> yeah, no, not nothing like that uh, on my end. Gotcha. Just, just, so, just index investing. Yeah. So thanks for doing this. What um, What's next? What's next for you now that you're retired slash semi-retired? You know, what what does the next five, 10 years look like? What What's the plan? Yeah, honestly, at this point, it's it's trying to find the right balance uh, because there's, I mean, the health thing is critical. I have two kids, so that's very critical to me as well. But I've also learned after trying the full retirement piece, and this is, by the way, like a very common thing, which I think, I mean, I mean I'm sure you've got a lot of really wealthy listeners listening uh, to your podcast, you know, invest who made money on real estate or, or other means. Um, what I have found in my from my own experience, but also interviewing others that have hit financial independence early, is that you know, you kind of have that honeymoon phase after you hit that number. So you have fun. And and, and for me, it, that was that lasted six months from the research I've done interviewing people. The average is probably around a year where you're like, this is amazing. I never have to work, I can just watch Netflix play games or whatever, do your thing. But then eventually you start to feel unfulfilled because you're not getting that intellectual stimulation. You're not getting fulfillment. You're not really giving like back to society. It's all just like kind of hedonistic in a sense. And so uh, eventually you want something again for that creative stimulation, intellectual stimulation. Uh, you want to uh, do something where you're like, okay, things worked out well for us. Obviously there's a luck component like there is with everything. And so like, you know, like I didn't retire and then we had the great depression. Right. So like there's, there's a luck element to it too. Right. Uh, I was born in Canada. So, or not, sorry, I was not born in Canada. I grew up in Canada. So like, that's very lucky. Right. Cause I could have been born in a, like I could be getting drafted to go to war or something. Right. If I was, born. so, yeah. you know, there, there is, there is like that kind of, so you, you kind of want to, you're like, okay, you recognize that. Yeah. You worked hard. You, you played your cards, right. The ones you were dealt or at least a, a lot of them you played correctly. So it worked out well for you, but you also kind of want to give back. And so, um, yeah, so I mean, like to answer your question, um, a big thing is to keep running the Bullet Canada podcast um, because, I mean, there, like I said, there's always something to optimize. Things always keep on changing. It's really fun to interview others that have hit financial independence, learn how did they do. Like that's what my, one of my favorite types of episodes is, other than like the optimizing ones, is talking to others that have also hit it because there's so many different paths to get there. Like I did it through index investing and some real estate and having my own businesses. Uh, in your case, like, you know, with your listeners, probably a lot of them did it through real estate, right? Uh, since you guys are a real estate investing podcast. <laughs> so like self-selecting group, right? Um, and so... Um, yeah, so I just think just to keep basically doing that, um, to keep optimizing my own finances, helping others optimize theirs as well from the lessons learned, learning these best practices. Um, and yeah, like, you know, the podcast, it's free. You get to learn for free from some of the best in Canada and it's specifically for Canadians. Uh, yeah. So hopefully your listeners, uh, check it out. Yeah, they will. <clears throat> Excuse me. How can they, um, what's the best way to track you down or, or to, to follow along or reach out? Yeah, so the podcast is literally in every podcast player. And if it's not, like, please let me know. But it, it should be in every one when I check. So uh, whatever podcast player you like to use, you can just search Build Wealth Canada. Uh, and then you'll see me um, uh, there. And you can basically download, stream all the episodes for free. Um, so that's one way. Uh, also, there's the, the website where I have all the different show notes and resources, uh, things like that. Um, so like if you mentioned some like, useful tool on the site that you may find useful, uh, all of that is there. Uh, so the website is just Build Wealth Canada. Uh, so buildwealthcanada.ca you can go there like you know 90 like you mentioned that I have the course but literally like 99% of the things on the site are completely free like I don't even really push the course it's just um, like we, we have sponsors now on the show because the podcast is big enough um, but it's so it's really all about providing really good you know high quality free financial literacy education to Canadians so that whether you're wealthy or just starting off so that you kind of learn these best practices. Uh, Cause like I said, there's a lot of conflict of interest in the industry in Canada. So a lot of people do get ripped off, unfortunately. And so this is kind of my way to like combat that and, you know, <laughs> fight for the people that, you know, so that they, that they don't get taken advantage of. Cause obviously that has a ripple effect, like on their kids and on the retirement and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah. So I hope people check it out. Uh, yeah. Build Wealth Canada. That's the podcast. That's great. Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll put the links down below in YouTube and in the podcast so people can awesome. track you down and, and find you and follow along. But uh, Cornell, thank you very much for doing this. Really appreciate it. It was um, very uh, enlightening to hear your story and congratulations on being retired. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been fun.